Welcome to the Pagosa Adventures podcast. If you've been watching us on YouTube, you know that we are all about RVs, leisure travel vans, gear, gadget, and everything in between. We love travel, and today we are going to be talking about all kinds of RV topics. Thanks for joining us today. I've got Ben here with me. Hello, Ben. What's up? All right, so I am super excited because fall is here, and there's nothing I like better than fall RVing. And you're going where? I am about to head off to Colorado, going to Creed. Janet and I are going to Creed, meeting my cousin there who has a fifth wheel. And so she obviously has a little bit larger of a rig than us, but we are going to be one lean, mean fighting machine with our little leisure travel van. Do they have a, they have a fifth wheel? Where are they coming from? They're coming from San Antonio. Okay. And so, y'all just meet up there in Creed? Yeah, so we're going to meet in Creed. There is a really nice... A really nice luxury uh, RV park there. Well, it's mostly meant for Class A's, but they do allow, you know, fifth wheels and then the Class C's, like, you know, the leisure travel vans. Uh, whereas in Pagosa Springs, across the mountain, um, what obviously we're called Pagosa Adventures and Pagosa Supply Co., because that's our neck of the woods there. But across the, across the mountain in Pagosa, they have a all-Class A RV park. You have to have a Class A to get in there. And it's right on the river. Really nice. I'd really like to, to go there, but I can't. So you would go there? I would, but they don't allow me. So when you go to Creed, like what is what does it look like when you actually, you're going to be up there for how long and, and what is the agenda? Well, so we're going to be doing a lot of fly fishing. Okay. So my cousin's husband loves to fly fish. My whole family loves to fly fish. I've tried it a few times. I'm not a big fly fisher, but uh, in the fall, that is awesome and creed is fantastic it's known for fly fishing okay so the rio grande runs right through there um, in fact my family had a place on the rio grande for a million years it's fantastic river raft on there all kinds of things and so so yeah the, the agenda is just get out of this texas heat yeah okay it's still what 95 today something like that crazy down here in dallas uh but just get out of the texas heat up in the mountains and just enjoy so you have a strong emotional connection to Creed, that area of Colorado? Is there any other hot, popular RVing areas in Colorado? Why would you go there over them? Well, in fact, I uh, I actually have a blog post on Pagosa Springs um, area on the Leisure Travel Vents site. So um, if you go over to our website, pagosasupply.co, um, you'll see the Leisure Explorers. Click on there. I, got, I wrote a whole article about why my family has been going to Pagosa Springs in the Creed area literally since the 1940s. My grandfather discovered it back then and ever since then every one of us i mean people uh, my sister owns a cabin there uh, my uncle used to own a lodge there my dad used to live there for you know right after he he retired semi-retired um and i mean tons of family um memories i mean i've been going there since i was a kid but it's just i mean it's absolutely gorgeous on top of the mountain is wolf creek ski so we go skiing in the winter um yeah. And Wolf Creek is an unbelievable ski area. Very, you know, it's kind of like the hidden gem because yeah. it, it's not a place where you can go stay. You get either have to stay in Pagosa Springs or you have to stay in Creed. Gotcha. So it doesn't have a lot of tourists. So well, you go to Vail, Breckenridge, Keystone, you know, all of those. It's just a billion people all the time. Yeah. Well, Wolf Creek is like no uh -huh. left lines, no nothing. Excellent skiing. But anyway, back to RVing is, yeah, so we're going to stay um, there at the luxury RV park in Creed. There's a few places to, to stay in Creed, but my cousin actually chose this one this time. I've never stayed there, so uh, but I'm looking forward to it. It's right on the river as well. Uh, I, now, I picture that the RVing community kind of migrate together region to different regions of the U.S. based on the temperature in that stage of the year. Is that accurate or are people like trying to, are they going after areas that's going to be 75 sunny and yeah. Hey, in, in February, we're going to this region. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a lot of people that chase weather. I'm one of those, you yeah. know, I like to chase the weather, you know, um, cause if you've lived in down here in Texas or you know anywhere that it's really hot and humid, I mean, you're from Houston, which is 10,000 times miserable. Worse. I mean, you're up here in Dallas now, so, you know, it got a little better, not much, but got a little bit better as far as heat, humidity. But getting out of this is my number one. That's a, probably the biggest reason that I got an RV in the first place. So most people are chasing that that temperate 
kind of mild weather. There's nobody that's like, hey, I actually like cold weather and I want to be in snowy areas. So I'm going wherever the snow is going to be. Actually, there's a there's a big. In fact, if you look on YouTube, there is a channel that I watch. I can't remember the exact name of it, but uh, they're they're um, they have these tents on top of their jeeps, mm-hmm. and they literally go out in the middle of nowhere and stay in the freezing, freezing cold. And um, I mean, that kind of looks appealing to me a little bit, but yeah. Not not as much. But right now, as as summer's turning to fall, mm-hmm. is like the ideal window to to be up in the Crete area. Oh yeah, I mean it's going to be in the forties, fifties at night, which is my I love that. Yeah. Build yourself a fire, a little campfire. Um, in the days, you know, sixties and seventies, beautiful. And there's nothing like standing out on the river, you know, whether you're fly fishing or you're hiking. That's the perfect weather. It and and how long is it going to take you to, to get up there? Well, we do it in a, str- I mean, you, you could drive it in a day. Like when my brother drives up there, he, he goes straight through. I mean, gotcha. he, yeah, they, it doesn't matter what time they leave. He ain't stopping. Okay. And he'll drive straight through myself. I go halfway. So we usually, it takes 12 hours from Dallas. Okay. So we'll stop in the Amarillo area. I mean, if we're get a real early start, we'll go past Amarillo a little bit. Um, and stop and stay the night. And, you know, I'm not a guy that just is a get there guy. So I plan to, you know, make sure we don't drive too, too long. So this is going to be a legitimate RV trip. Now you've been RVing in your LTV for a while now. Mm -hmm. How have you enjoyed the experience? What what are some things that you've learned? Okay. So here's the great thing about leisure travel van that I think a lot of people in a larger rig probably frustrates them and irritates them is if I wanted to, there are some like drive throughs that I could use. Like if I wanted to stop and drive through, if it's got a big enough clearance, we can, we can take our leisure travel in through. Not that we do that, but if you are in a fifth wheel, if you are in a class a, you are, I mean, you have to really plan on fuel stops because you don't know if you can get in and get out. If you're towing, like if you're in a class a and you're in your flat towing a car, you can't back up, right? And so you have to double plan. If I need fuel, can I get out? So generally you're looking, if you're in one of those big class A's, generally you're looking for a truck stop because those are designed to not have to back up or get congested and plenty of room to move around for a big vehicle. With my leisure travel van, I can pull into a 7-Eleven. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if I can pull in there with all the cars, you know, anywhere that has diesel, I can pull in. Um, if we want to go to the grocery store, I don't have to look to see. In fact, we were in um, this summer. We were in Chama, New Mexico, and uh, their grocery store is tiny. Parking lot is tiny, and I saw a fifth wheel pulled on the side of the road down from there. And they were park. They were parking. That's the only place I could park to go to the grocery store. Was on the side of the road and have to walk. Well, I just pulled right into the parking lot, right? And so the leisure travel van, the ease of drivability, the ease that, that you can literally go anywhere is such a huge selling point and the reason i decided because i was going to get the big you know a newmar as a 43 footer actually um a newmar 43 footer and man i learned so quickly that i probably don't want to deal with that so you've enjoyed the the freedom and convenience that comes with the oh the gosh smaller, yeah. yeah travel 100 because it, it gives you it gives you more freedom than you even think about Yep. Now, you can flat tow a car with you know, your travel van, and a lot of people do that. And I actually like the idea of, of, of flat towing a car because uh, while the leisure travel van can go everywhere, when you set up camp and if you're at a full service and you've got your water hooked up, you've got your electric hooked up and everything, and you want to go sightseeing or you want to go to the store, go out to eat, anything like that, well, then you got to go out, break camp, fold up your chair, blah, blah, blah. Well, if you have a car, then obviously you just jump in the car and go. But again, that does limit your freedoms as far as, you know, pulling into some places or getting gas or, I mean, fuel or, or whatever. So, but anyway, yeah, leisure travel man is the way to go. So are you, would you say, would you grow, did you grow up um, going on RV trips as a kid or are you, would you say Never. like a first time RV? Never. Or, so then how, when did that idea come to you of, hey, I, I, I think I'd like to own an RV. I want to start exploring this whole world. You know, I told a, um, a story 
once on the leisure travel um, website, that ba basically how I got into RVing, which was I stumbled across a YouTube video one time. Randomly, randomly suggested to you so, well, yeah i was just up there so i watched it and i thought hey you know that's kind of interesting so as soon as i watched it the youtube said hey i guess this guy likes rv videos and served me another one and another one and another one well i got into it big time because we are i mean we we're big time travelers we travel all the time and um or did you know back in the day whenever before covid uh we were always flying to europe or flying to las vegas flying to wherever right and so um, I didn't like to drive necessarily, but I was watching RV video after RV video, and I thought, what an awesome way to see things that you would never really, that you would normally just fly over. And was it appealing also that you would get to see more of the United States, which yeah. is the country you live in? And 100%. Yeah, yeah and, and to be able to experience. And so what I soon figured out is I don't like to drive. I dread driving if I have an agenda. Mm -hmm. Like if I have to be three hours away in three hours. Yeah. I, that is, that I dread that. But if you tell me, okay, you need to go, okay, I'm going to go to this place that's three, four hours away, then you take all day to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Pull into the little towns, you know, uh, and, you know, and, and just go up, take the back road, yo. get off the interstate. I'll do that all day. I absolutely love it. And driving the leisure travel vans is like a dream anyway. So it's like very comfortable. So when you first started to get this idea, obviously it sounds like YouTube really informed you or, or influenced you and in, in where to explore on which option should I go with and maybe see how, how it worked for them. What other places influenced your decisions as you were researching? Yeah, so I mean, that was probably the biggest thing because whenever, and I think a lot of people, and probably a lot of people listening to this are either trying to decide on an RV, don't own an RV, stumbled across leisure travel vans or have one ordered and they can't get it for two years and they've never even stepped inside one. So if you haven't really been able to, like I, like I, you know, I was just watching them on, on, on YouTube. So I didn't really see or feel or the one thing that you'll notice whenever that you actually do step in an RV is you can automatically tell if it's quality or not. Right. Mm -hmm. You can walk into some RV brands and say, this thing is going to fall apart and a yeah. year. Okay. Or there are some brands you can walk in on leisure travel vans, one of those, and just say, dang, this is really well built and very comfortable, very well thought out. Right. So that is probably one of the biggest things is, so I, like I said, I was going to do a Numar. Okay. And I really researched all of the, the, you know, Tiffin, Integra, uh, and Numar were, are the kind of the big three that people buy that or under a million dollars and, you know, and over the ones that could possibly, you know, you get what you pay for type thing. Um, and so I was pretty much convinced. Test drove them everything. And, and is that because you had narrowed it down to the RV category you thought that you wanted? And well, then within that, you started to do deeper research? Yeah. So I absolutely thought we needed the more room. Okay. Yeah. Because, you know, we live in a pretty big house and, you know, we're used to room and we're used to all of this stuff. And I thought more room was better, but I learned it's not right. Um, if you're living in it, yeah, you may want to, you know, to do that. But if you're just doing it recreationally, I mean, the RV, you don't want to be inside the RV. You want to be outside doing the outside things that you are RVing doing. You're doing the sightseeing, you're doing the kayaking, you're doing the, the hiking, all of those things. But, um, and so the livability, while it should be comfortable, I mean, they, every RV has comfort and, and everything to it. But, you know, the size of it needs to equate to what's going to be the easiest, the, uh, the easiest way to get, to, to get into it, one, without spending half a million if you don't want to. Um, you know, the maintenance, all of those different things, those deciding factors. And when I figured it out, I'm like, okay, if I get one of these 43-footers, it's going to be a nightmare. I mean, a nightmare. You can't go everywhere you want to go. You can't fit one of those into a national park. High cost of ownership, probably storage, Huge cost of ownership, maintenance. Oh, yeah, fuel. I mean, they you know they get seven miles of the gallon, um, you know, and and so just it's just constant, you know. So did that ultimately feel like it was maybe 
too intimidating of a coach to get as a first time RVer, and you wanted to like maybe ease into. I mean, I could definitely see where it wasn't intimidating to me, but I. But what it, what it boiled down to me was I didn't want the I didn't want the headache. Yeah. Because I also jumped on all of the uh, all of the Facebook groups, the Integra group, the Tiffin group, Newmar group. And any group you're in, if you could get on that leisure travel van group, you're going to say, you know, everybody has problems. RV equals problems. Not when, but if. Not, I mean, not if, but when, right? So, but what I was, what the differences are is when you're talking about the giant monsters, is you're talking about an engine issue that would be $13,000 mm-hmm. just to fix. Yeah. Okay. And you probably need a specialized person that. Yeah. Every five years, you got to replace the tires at around $6,000. Wow. Okay. And there's, you know, and, and so tires on an RV, they don't go by miles. Those, those RV tires are meant to go a lot of miles. Time is their enemy. Okay. And so you can have tires that look like, oh, plenty of tread you know, everything, but what happens is the UV rays, all, all kinds of things. And you have a tire blowout in one of those, you're a goner. Yep. I mean, it's a goner. And then try to get that thing towed, whatever. So it's just like, oh my gosh, the problems equated with a class A compared to the problems with a towable or with, a you know, something the size of a leisure travel van, the chasm is so great there that, you know, you break down on with the leisure travel van, the same tow truck that can you know, pick up your F-150 can take your, you know, so. So, so would t- you would you say that the problems are a lot of the same problems, just the scale is different? They're, it's a lot easier to deal with a problem at a, at a smaller scale like oh, in an LTV. Yeah. So, so most of the problems within the RV space are going to be relatively the same, whether you have a big Class A or. Yeah, the slide that's yeah. not going to work. The awning gets stuck. The, you know, you have an engine def problem. You've got, you know something you know a, yeah. a cabinet falls apart you know it's anything that can go wrong in a class a can go wrong in a class c class b towable and so you just starting to see those stories in those facebook groups started to make you think hey do i really want to do this do Maybe i want I to look- deal with yeah. it yeah yeah so it went from being a recreational vehicle to a oh my gosh, this is going to drive me insane. So then you switched your researching focus away from that class of RV to a different class. To a different class, to a towable actually, right? Okay. And so if you've watched my YouTube channel, you know that we are about to get into the towable game. We're actually going to add to our RV arsenal and get a towable. And so um, towables are great as well. I mean, they're, they're something that you can enjoy as well. You say, well, well you've already got a leisure travel van. Why are you going to get a towable? It's just different. I mean, the the... Towable is going to give us a little more room. Um, it's going to give us the ability to, you know, have that that vehicle that you can leave your RV at, at the campsite and go off and explore. So several reasons that I that I want the best of both worlds. And so we're at a place in life that, you know, we, where we can do that. And so we're going to do it. So when you started to research kind of in this new class of RVs, I'm sure there were a couple of brands that you started to evaluate. What about LTV in, in particular, was the primary selling point for you? So, yeah. So whenever you look at LTV, um, I actually stamp, stumbled across their YouTube channel. And I will tell you this right now. that I mean, YouTube has got to be a boon for the RV industry because I'm everybody generally discovers or does all their research on YouTube about which RV they're going to buy and, 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 and basically makes their decision off of YouTube, especially for leisure travel vans because people cannot see one. They can't... St- they can't test drive them. They can't walk into them because they don't exist. Well, I remember you sending me uh, the video of the demo of the LTV, and I thought it was incredibly well done. The salesperson was fantastic. I really felt like they covered every detail. It was like a 20-minute video. It's a pretty long video to sit through, but people want that kind of information when they're going to make such a big expense. Right, and, and LTV does such a great job, and they do some things that are just really ingenious, just some little little touches. And so... That's where I'm like, okay, yeah, that is crazy awesome, right? Yep. So so it sounds like there's a decision funnel. So decision A is, hey, I want an RV. Decision B is, okay, what class of RV? And then decision C is, once I identify the class, like what brand of RV I'm, I'm going with. So then you landed on LTV, but then now that opened up a whole new 
set of decisions, which is, okay, well, now which model of LTV? Yeah, so so I think that anybody in that in the vein of the class C, can they call it a B plus for marketing, uh, but the cl- small class C, is, well, on the Mercedes or the Ford chassis, is, a leisure travel van is definitely at the top of the pile. Okay, the quality, the community. I liken it almost to like Harley dealers or Har- Harley people. Mm-hmm. You know, if you if if you own a Harley. Somebody pulls up next to you on a Honda. You don't even look at them, right? You're just yeah. like, oh my gosh, you got a Honda, I got a Harley. You know, I'm, we're in a different class of people, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that Leisure Travel Vans has done a really good job of making sure that they are the Harley Davidson of the small class C mm-hmm. um, line. And the community is even like that. I mean, I've got, I've been at places where people go like, oh my gosh, you have a leisure travel van. I've, I've been watching these or I've seen it and I've just never seen one in person. It's a unicorn. Um, you know, if you're just, if you've got a like normal RV, nobody's saying that, you know? Right, 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 right. <laughs> so it is. It's more than an RV. It's, yeah, it's more than an RV. It's, all, it's almost like it's a lifestyle, you know? Yeah. Um, lifestyle and, is what I was going to say. It sounds like there's this community of people. It's close knit. They're. They're obviously people are probably like you that do their research. They are enthusiasts that get mm-hmm. really far into whatever they're in, invested in. Yeah. So. And the, I was fortunate enough that I was able to, I was in the leisure travel van market before they became extinct as far as being able to, to have them on dealer lots and, and do walkthroughs. And so. Because the demand has increased so much or what is demand COVID? I mean, there's just all kinds of issues. And so, um, you, you know, now it's really, really backed up. There for a while, Mercedes had a, um, they had a, a, a problem with the EPA here in, in the States. And so um, they were having, a, they were having a hard time getting the chassis. That's, that was the problem when I bought mine was, you know, if you could get a chassis to, for them to even build on, you were, you were fortunate. Well, now with COVID, the RV boom, the popularity of leisure travel vans, I mean, it's just, it's, you know, super hard to even, I mean, people are waiting two, three years. Yeah. And so, so now that you you basically have gone from not being involved with the RV world to now being very involved and deep in the RV world, what would you tell yourself if you were going back and, and maybe speaking to somebody that's thinking about getting an RV, kind of getting introduced to the space a little bit, something you know now that you didn't know then that you wish you did? Well, the biggest thing that I know now is about RV electricity. Okay. And, and it's very intimidating. Okay. Um, you know, all of the terminology, how does it even work? Um, and of course I jumped, I jumped in and I love the idea of not being handcuffed to a power pole. Okay. Okay. And so I knew lithium, I wanted lithium, I wanted solar, I wanted to not have to, you know, to operate the, the RV without being in an RV park. If I wanted to go park in the middle of a of a field or dispersed camping or, you know, BLM land or something that I would have plenty of power to, to do everything that we needed to do. Is and that something you knew coming in? Like, Hey, it's going to be limiting my range. No. Or is that like, was a discovery? Like, man, this is, yeah, I discovery. thought it was going to be more freeing than it is. Well, yeah, no, I, it, uh, you know, whenever you first think about it and, it, and not everybody, you know, the big class A, and we'll keep going back to these big class A's is the big class A's. They don't necessarily have the ability to go boondocking. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're meant for an RV park. They're meant to be backed up or pulled through with a power pole, with a sewer connection, with a water connection. Now you can, now they do have big water tanks and black tanks and things like that, but generally they're not meant to, you know, take off the the highway. Right. Whereas with a leisure travel van, I can pull off on a dirt road, a logging road. I can go and do that easily. Same thing with if, you know, a lot of people do with their four by four trucks and, you know, a towable, take it out in the middle of the uh, middle of nowhere, which is really awesome. So in that instance, you really start to feel the need for more power. That's whenever I thought, okay, okay. Then I, you, then it go, you go down the rabbit hole again of YouTube and there's so much out there about, um, lithium batteries, solar, you know, being off grid, and I love the idea of being off grid so much so that, you know, now we've been selling with the Onyx batteries, you know, you and I have the Pagosa Supply Co. 
and um, selling lithium batteries because I'm the kind of guy, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it all the way, right? And so I ordered the big 315 amp hour battery, had no clue what all it took in order, say, if I wanted to run my air conditioner off of that. Well, there's a lot more to it than just putting in the lithium battery, right? And um, and if you want to learn how we do all that, it's, you know, because of supply.co slash lithium. We should probably do an episode at some point and just dive into all the details about upgrading your lithium. Yeah. I'm sure people would be sure. interested to hear that. There's a lot of people that just upgrade their batteries, right? Okay. And, um, and their solar. You, you, the only limitation you have on just upgrading your, your battery is you can't run your air conditioner. Mm. Possibly your microwave, depending on what size inverter you've got. But with my setup, it's like being at home. I can run my air conditioner. I can run anything in the coach. But that required a inverter upgrade, wiring upgrade, T-fuse upgrade. I mean, a lot. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot, but not terrible. But now I'm, I am, uh, especially in these days, man, I am free, free, free. I can go anywhere and live off the land if and I wanted to. So do you, do you find yourself wanting to go back to Creed because you know it's going to be just an awesome experience? Or do you find yourself wanting to explore what else is out there? And, or is there a lot involved with the planning of that so you don't even bother because it just adds complexity to your trip? Yeah, I mean, this trip was, like I said, my, I'm meeting my cousin up there. So, um, and it's a place we go all the time anyway. And, you know, I'm there at least once, twice a year anyway in that area. Um, and so this is an easy trip. I know exactly where I'm going. I don't have to plan. I don't have to say, okay, I need to know where fuel stops. I mean, I've driven this route a million times. So, um, so yeah, that's an easy one. And um, my plan is now that COVID's kind of settling down, the ultimate goal that we haven't been able to do is Canada. Okay. Um, I we, know that's where LTV's headquartered. Yeah, they're they're in Winkler, Manitoba, but. Um, there's some people, well, since they're headquartered in Canada, there's a lot of Canadian leisure travel van owners. And every time they post, you know, those pictures in the Canadian Rockies and the ice blue water rivers and the lakes. Oh, I mean, the Canadian Rockies just makes the American Rockies look like hills. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. They're so much more majestic and I can't explain it. And I've been to Banff many, many times. Love Banff. Love Lake Louise, love Jasper, that whole area. Absolutely love it. And so that's the ultimate goal is to get up there. And um, So that's number one probably on the list. Oh, 100%. As, well, soon as, as soon as we can. I mean, I, I heard that they have opened the borders now. They may have shut them back down because of this Delta stuff. But, um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's the number one plan. Shoot up to Canada. So what would you say is your, your top five list? That's number one. So what would be like maybe two through five? Well, you have to. So, so what I really want to do as far as America is Oregon, Washington, down the uh, the California Highway 1. I mean, that Big Sur, all of that's like awesome. And mm-hmm. so that's that's probably the number one in America. But then you can really like, you know, every area is awesome. The Southwest is awesome, you know. Yeah. So in the winter, you know, check out the desert, you know. Um, go to Florida in the winter. Go down to the Keys. Um, and in the summer, go where it's cool. Yeah. You know, I think this summer was a little weird because I think sometimes uh, the Northwest was a little, even hotter than it was here. So... So but, what would have been the most helpful maybe apps or resources to discover, you know, just destinations, places to hook up? So we normally use, um, so RV Life, which is RV Trip Wizard. I mean, they've got a whole slew of, of apps and things like that. Then there's Com- Compendium. I mean, there's, a, there's tons of apps. And whenever you, when you have a leisure travel van, you don't have to worry too much about using like their navigation because the navigate RV navigation is kind of set up to say, okay, here's a low overpass, here's a bridge that can't support forty thousand pounds. But whenever you're the size of a leisure travel van, you can go most everywhere. There's not going to be too many. Our leisure travel van is slightly under eleven foot. I mean, I think if you're up in the northeast, you could probably find some some bridges down a country road that might be less than eleven feet. Um, but generally, if you're in any modern 
anywhere, you're going to be fine. You don't have to get those, uh, the, the navigation that's going to say, okay, you need to avoid this road because you weigh too much or you're too high. So it seems like there's so many just benefits and, and conveniences with an LTV. What would you say is like maybe the biggest thing you miss or you feel like you don't have in an LTV? Well, definitely space. I mean, space. I mean, once you are inside that thing, we have an FX that uh, has the Murphy bed that you fold down. When that Murphy bed is down, I mean, that's it takes up a lot of room. So your kitchen is basically useless. Um, you do we do have the room lounge, which is nice. So if somebody you know is an early riser and wants to get out of bed, and you know, we we do have another living area. So that's positive. But, yeah, I think it's just space, you know. You just got to learn. You know, we got the two dogs, and it's a lot. Yeah. You know, whenever you get two dogs, two people, two, you know, humans in there. Um, it's and a lot so, more space than a van, but it's not going to be a class A. A lot, more, a lot more space than a van. But when you jump into, a, like, a fifth wheel, fifth wheel is like having a, another home. Yeah. I mean, it's a separate bedroom. The bathroom is completely separate. The living area is usually huge kitchen amenities with everything so if you want that type yeah fifth wheel is probably the most economical way to have a lot of space so there's no perfect solution it's really what kind of travel experience you want to have and that's probably why you're also getting a fifth wheel so you can make that determination from the beginning hey this is the kind of trip we want to have going here yeah and so if if you have the ability to have both options if you want to go and say hey we want some nice live we're going to stay in an area for a while okay that's where you really want the towable the fifth wheel or even a class a we're going to be here for a while and we're just going to explore the area for a week two weeks three weeks whatever it may be uh the leisure travel van really gets you like hey i just wanted to just go you know stop over at a cracker barrel at night sleep and then off to the next adventure that's what's really great about a leisure travel van um, but yeah, so the, the larger living area, I think, would probably be best if you're going to be at an area for a long time. Would you think it's a good idea to maybe just before you purchase, rent different classes of, of RVs and just take them out for a trip and see which one suits you best? If you're getting into a basic RV, yeah. But if you rent, usually rentals aren't nice RVs. So it wouldn't necessarily give you an it's accurate... Not gonna, it's, yeah, if you take... If you take a cheap RV out, you might come back saying that's for the birds because mm. this broke, it rattled, you know, we broke down, you know, it could become really not fun. Yeah. If you go in a leisure travel van, something like that, I mean, like I said, things break, but not near as often, not, you know, we've never had any issues on mine that couldn't be solved very simply. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can rent one. Man, it's just scary because usually the ones that people rent are the ones that they don't care about. Yeah. You so know? just take it with a grain of salt that hey, it, it's probably not going to be the same thing to make a thing. to make a good decision yeah. off of. But if you're in the if you're in the market for you know if you're just going to go a week a year, yeah, rent one. Yeah. Don't buy. You know. You know what would you say is that threshold of hey, if you're getting out more than this amount, then it's worthwhile looking at purchasing. Well, I mean, obviously it depends on, you know, I use my leisure travel van for more than just traveling. You know, I use it for our channel, our YouTube channel, I use it for our product, you know, our, our product, you know, um, uh, R and D uh, and plus I just like having it and, you know, and so if you're in that space, it doesn't really matter if you just enjoy owning an RV, not necessarily even using it every week or taking it out for a month at a time. Uh, you know, a lot of people are boat people. They don't yeah. use their boats that often, but they enjoy owning a boat or they're motorcycle people. And they just enjoy owning a motorcycle. Now, RV is a little more expensive than boats and or most boats and motorcycles. But uh, if you literally are just going to say, okay, we're going to take this out two weeks a year. You know, I mean, if you're at a financial place that you can afford to drop six figures, you know, great. But if you're not, yeah, the rental may be something you want to look at or something that's very inexpensive. Yeah. And so just depending on where you are and your RVing you know, is accessible to almost anybody that wants to oh, do it. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, there's RVs, a lot of, in fact, I think that one, um, it seems a trend is the smaller RV, like the, the ones that are really, really 
almost impossible to buy because of the demand are the smaller ones so like the leisure travel van like the r pod you know the um especially the fiberglass um rvs right now um the um i forgot what they're called the uh, uh the oscars maybe those that type of things new camps good luck trying to find one of those people are snatching them up like crazy because they're smaller cheaper to store cheaper to haul i mean it's just imp- almost impossible so i think the real trend is the smaller rv so do you feel like the <laughs> rv industry in general are they pretty innovative and in trying new technologies and designs or is it oh is yeah it, okay yeah i mean some are yeah depends on the brand i'm sure depends on the brand depends on their target audience the basic target audience rv guy you know somebody who doesn't do a lot of research say okay i'm gonna go buy me a trailer they're gonna go buy you know a no frills trailer you know way overpay for it you know um but the real discernible rv people who have done their research people who know what they want what kind of camping they want to do which is maybe not be hooked to a power pole so the rv world is really embracing the whole solar lithium battery thing right they know Mm -hmm. that you know this is what people want um and that's one of the biggest reasons that i wanted to make sure that we became a lithionics authorized dealer was it just provides an enhancement to your rv life and so once i got my 315 amp hour lithium battery and i could run my air conditioner you know i could run anything and i don't have to be you know my solar charges up during the day and i mean i just always have power i never worry about power ever that makes rving funner Mm -hmm. it makes it a lot more fun than wondering okay oh oh no we we're almost out of battery and you know so but rv companies are recognizing that and so they're offering rv options and but it's always more expensive so if you buy the leisure travel van lithium batteries i mean it's really overpriced and you know but i mean it just comes that way if that's the thing you want to do then you don't want you know yeah but yeah but man the rv i mean if you buy a solar package or a lithium package from the rv dealer i mean you're paying three to four times more than if you were to just buy it and put it in yourself or have your dealer put it in but yeah we've talked a lot about a lot of different topics i have so many more questions like we could dive into specific models within the LTV space. We could dive into the uh, um, lithium, lithium battery upgrade. We could also, you know, I'm almost wondering if we couldn't explore um, different accessories and must-haves for going on different trips. So Heck yeah, man. So we've of- got, yeah. So I think with this podcast, that's obviously the first episode, right? So one thing, I love listening to podcasts while we travel. And I love listening to the different RV podcasts and, and, um, but we have so many topics to be able to explore. So make sure you hit subscribe and, or, you know, on Apple podcasts, whatever you're listening to this on hit subscribe. So, you know, when we drop another one, uh, also subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Pagosa adventures. And where we're always talking about RV stuff. So. And give us your feedback. I mean, comment, let us know what topics you might be interested in hearing us discuss. Uh, we'd love to engage the community and our listeners that way. So thank you guys for sticking with us all the way through this point. Yeah, absolutely. And um, like I said, hopefully we'll have a whole bunch more of these.